Podcast. Um, we're joined as usual by Dylan, and we're also joined by a special guest in our 120-time NRL uh, player in Justin Horro, and also known in the podcasting and social media game as the Scope. Uh, Justin, how are you going, mate? Good boys. Thanks for having me. No worries. Our pleasure. So you originally started off your career at Parramatta, uh, then you moved over to Manly, and you, you support Manly now is very well known. Um, you're calling them the bird gang, bird gang, all that sort of stuff. What club did you support growing up? And um, if it wasn't originally Manly, then what what made you choose Manly over Para? Um, so originally, I was I followed my dad. So my dad played NRL uh, when I was younger. He played. He started off at Parramatta. That's where he got his run as well. Uh, and then he went from Parramatta to West, and I sort of just followed dad while he was still playing. And then he finished up at the Warriors. Um, when I, when dad finished up playing, uh, I, we moved back to Penrith. That's where I grew up and I played at Cambridge park. And, uh, one of the most famous, uh, Cambridge park players is Brad Fittler. And he was currently at, at the Roosters. So Roosters was my team, uh, growing up. And then, um, once you start getting into rep footy and you, and you start playing yourself, you sort of, your allegiances start tying in with obviously whoever you're playing at. Um, the two NRL clubs were, were Parramatta and Manly. Uh, but with, as you know, boys, you've probably done your research, probably didn't have my better years at Parramatta in terms of results and uh, how we went. So uh, I got over to Manly and we, you know, we got all the way to a grand final and um, you got a really close knit team there. So that sort of is my team. I obviously still love Parra. Uh, I got, um, you know, I was really close with the boys there as well. And then I even played in the Super League. So I still follow the Catalan Dragons who I played for and, and Wakefield Trinity as well. And um, I sort of, you know, I don't really, probably Manly, uh, you know, because Manly uh, have been going well of late, I, you know, sort of jump on the bandwagon with it all. But um, you probably don't really have a, an actual team and I, and I support all four, four equally. Also, I just sort of, I was watching um, the Ice Project the other day. Sean Johnson came up on there. Um, he was saying how he was just about to go to the Bulldogs. Um, that sort of came out on there. What other NRL clubs were you uh, in a similar situation to Sean Johnson with where you're nearly about to sort of pencil a deal and then um, you eventually went elsewhere? Yeah, so there was, there was two opportunities. Newcastle was the first one. After my debut year, I went up to, um, to Newcastle, had a really good meeting with uh, Rick Stone, was the coach at the time. Um, so they offered me a deal uh, at, at the time it was, I was just negotiating with Parramatta and it, and it was, it wasn't about the money. It was about the years. So I was going to get more years to go to Newcastle. Um, so that was, uh, I got really close. Like I pretty much left that meeting and, and told Rick Stone that, yeah, I'm, I'm keen to come up. And then the next day um, I, I got back down to Parramatta, Parramatta found out about it. And then they offered me the extra year. So um, it was it was a little, little bit different to Shawnee's. I just ended up getting that security with with the years compared to the money. But um, yeah, I was pretty close to going to Newcastle after my first year in, in 2010. And then um, when I finished up at Parramatta, um, I had conversations about going down to the Storm before I went to Manly, and I thought I was all but done. But they were, it was this is more from their end. Uh, they were looking at a few other players that they ended up signing. So. Um, I thought I was going to go there. I was keen to go down to, to Melbourne and it just sort of fell through and then I ended up at Manly. So a bit of a blessing in disguise. We went to the grand final that year. So it ended up being a good year for me. Do you think your career would have panned out any different if you had sort of uh, signed on with Newcastle or, or the Storm? Um, yeah, it's, oh, I think about the Storm a fair bit because Newcastle were in a similar position to us at Parramatta. They were, they were sort of like a rebuilding, rebuilding phase down there. Um, the results sort of weren't going all that great for, for us or Newcastle at the time. But um, as you know, Melbourne and, and Manly were the, the probably the two strongest clubs throughout that period. But we were, we were both very different clubs. So um, 
especially now, knowing a few more of the boys, as you've probably seen, uh, we're really close with some of the boys that are there now and just being a part of that system and seeing how, um, you know, certain players have gone down there and really kicked on and, and had really good careers and won grand finals. Probably Melbourne's the one that I think about, like, you know, what, what my career would have been like if I went there. But um, like I said, that was, um, that was sort of wasn't my decision in the end. It was more, it was more coming from their, their end. Yeah, so you said that you started your career and then at Para and then moving on to Manly. What was sort of the move like? Obviously, some people talk about moving clubs is sort of hard, like Connor Watson when he said it was hard to leave KP and that. But what was the move like moving from Manly to uh, from Para to Manly? Sorry. Yeah, so uh, we we didn't have the best year in 2012, boys. I, I sort of fell out of favour at Para, so it was a little bit different for me. It was. With the Connor situation, um, a bit a bit, bit of like how I was talking about with the Newcastle, that was a, a big reason why I ended up staying at Para instead of going to Newcastle. I was so familiar with the boys. A um, couple of my mates that we played school footy with, uh, we were really close. So, um, like like I said, I didn't I said before about the money. The the money was a little bit better at Newcastle to go there, but I ended up staying at Parramatta purely because of the relationships that I already have there. Um, but with the Manly one, I, I just didn't have a club at that point. So um, I it was I didn't get I didn't sign at Manly until a week before preseason. So I I thought I was pretty much done um, in the NRL in 2012, and then I was starting to look over at the Super League at, at that year, and then Manly sort of coming through me a lifeline um, because uh, the coach for Parramatta now, Brad Arthur. I think you're familiar with with Brad Arthur too, your, your family. Um, he was my assistant coach at Parramatta and he was going over to Manly. So he was a big reason why um, I got to play another three years in the, in, in the NRL. Yeah, we, you sort of spoke about different clubs and that. Obviously, a new club coming into the NRL is the Dolphins. If you were one of the coaches there or the manager and you could make three key signings, who do you reckon that would be? Ooh. So I'd be looking at the Melbourne Storm straight away. Obviously, with with everything that's happening down there, with regards to they've got Harry Grant and Brendan Smith, who are both, you know, arguably the two best hookers in the comp at the moment. You know, you've got Damian Cook, you throw him into that conversation for sure, up in Coruscant. But there's a salary cap, boys. So I'd be trying to target Melbourne Storm, uh, whether that be uh, Harry, Brendan Smith, Cam Munster, uh, all those guys are sort of coming off contract in the next couple of years. I'd be happy to take one of them. Um, another big one is Joey Manu at the Roosters. Um, I think he comes off contract in on in that year, twenty three, uh, and he's he's sort of your strike player. He's and also looking for uh, fullback money as well, isn't he? And looking to sort of transition into the yeah. So well, you know, like you're the new club. Apparently, funds are really good up there. Um, he would be he would definitely be a, a player that I'd target. So one in the spine, one in the outside backs, and. I'm not too sure what's happening with. Uh, I know Tino Fasua Malawi just signed at uh, the Titans, and he's only in his first year. But I think he's sort of off contract at the same time as well. So, if he was to become available, um, yeah, the, the, those will probably be uh, my, my top three targets, boys. Yeah, going to your debut, you see some of the stories like Jay Garth and that. Their debut is probably the highlight of the career. What was your debut like? Finding out you're going to make your debut, and then the lead up, and then the actual game. Yeah, it was uh, a little bit different to, to to most boys. It was uh, it was it, it actually went as best as possible. So, um, it was round three of 2010, and I'd been 18th man a couple of times a year before. So close to debut one and then I was 18th man for the first two rounds um, and I had no idea so um, throughout the week uh, Daniel Mortimer was our 5'8 and Floydie Mateo was our second row at the time uh, but Daniel Mortimer had come down with um, with a flu it wasn't coronavirus boys it was back in back in 2010 but um, yeah so Daniel Mortimer was sick but the coach never told any of us so I had no idea so I got a call on on Friday, Friday afternoon at 3.30 p.m. Uh, it's from my coach, da Daniel Anderson at the time. And he asked me if I was ready to go. Uh, the game's obviously at 7.30 on Friday night. So 3.30 in the afternoon, I find out I'm, I'm about to debut. I quickly get on the phone, start messaging all my family, letting them know, trying to get tickets for the game. I was able to get, you know, four tickets for my two brothers, my mum and my dad. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's for everyone. You know, every, the debut game's... Um, yeah, probably your pinnacle. Of, uh, apart from boys, obviously, that go on and play for their country and, 
and play State of Origin. But it was quite a different experience. I actually liked it that way because I probably would have been nervous throughout the whole week if I'd found out earlier. So to find out at 3.30, I only had, you know, four hours to get my head around it and then uh, and then get out there on the field. So it was a little bit different than, uh, than, than most. Yeah, and then obviously going into that year, you played a bit of good footy and then received Rookie of the Year for Para. Um, what was it like to receive that award? Obviously, some good names getting that award. And how did you, how'd your first year of footy play out? Yeah, it was good, boys. It was I had a limited role because I was only really coming on and playing, um, you know, 25, 30 minutes a game. Um, I mentioned before that Filetti Matteo, um, he was a really good back row for Parramatta for a long time. Uh, they'd just come off the grand final the year before too. So the team was pretty set. Um, and then I'll just come on in, in spurts. And um, I was lucky enough to, when I debuted in, in round three, I ended up playing the rest of the season. So um, I think I sort of just won that, won that by default boys by, by playing every week compared to what um, other players uh, that had come through that year. But yeah, that was, that was really cool. And, you know, obviously really grateful to, to win that award. Like you said, some, some really good players won, won that award and, I was able to uh, go to the RLPA awards uh, for for rookie of the year nomination for the for the whole league. So that was like, I was a little bit older as well. So to be 23 and and, and finally crack the NRL and then um, start to get noticed in my first year was um yeah it was a, a really good feeling. Um, you talked about how Parramatta went through to the grand final uh, the year before. Obviously, a lot of very good players there, and you moved on to Manly. You made the grand final while you while you were there. Of all the players that you sort of played with, who was your sort of biggest mentor or maybe even a coach or assistant coach or someone like that? Um, yeah, there's, there's so many boys when, when, like, when you come through the grades, especially when you're, when you're younger. I, I sort of – it was probably less about um, – especially Parramatta, like starting off at Parramatta, for instance, when I was a rookie. It was less about like sort of what uh, players taught us on the field. But um, guys like Tamana Tahu and Eric Groth Jr., um, they just made you feel, they made me feel really comfortable when I come into the locker room. So um, it's quite a big step up when you, when you move on from reserve grade to first grade and uh, to have guys of that stature, like both those guys that played for New South Wales, I think, um, you know, it's Tamana, you know, played for, played for his country to so say to have guys like that, you know, welcome you into the locker room. Um, they made me feel really comfortable. They were massive. And then uh, moving on to Manly, like you said, they had, whole heap of guys that had played for the country, played for the state, won grand finals. So that was, again, once I got in that, that locker room, it was like, you know, even though I'd been playing for two or three years, I was still a little bit starstruck, you know, some, some big names and the Stuart brothers and Anthony Watmo and uh, Jamie Lyon and those, those sorts of guys. So um, just senior boys, that, they were um, guys that I tried to lean on when I was coming through the grades. Yeah, we... Um... We asked Craig Gower who his best player to play was with. Who do you reckon your best player to play was with, whether it be leadership or just what they showed on the field or even just skill? Who do you reckon the best player you ever played with was? Who did who did Craig Gower say to, by the way, boys? I uh, said uh, Girdler. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so uh, very similar to, to, to Gower. They would have played a fair bit. I think, would they have played on the same side? So for my for me, boys, it was Kieran Foran. Um I played with so many good players, but um, yeah, he was my 5'8 in 2013 and 14, and he just made me look better than what I was. He's uh, He was so tough. He um, a really good defender, and, you know, I probably wasn't the best defender, um, and he and he never passed me the ball where I was in, in, in a bad position. So um, he's one guy who probably um, extended my NRL career, so I always got to show, show props to, to Fozzie. And Fod's still going around. He's going pretty good. Uh, he went pretty good last year. Um, was playing some some really good footy after returning with DCE. Now, that was the halves combination back in 2013. Um, got you all the way to the grand final. What were your emotions like after that grand final? Was it sort of a, a bittersweet feeling where you're like, well, we made it. We, we had such a good year. Or was it just absolutely devastating for you? Yeah, a bit, a bit of a mixture, boy. So... Obviously, I was stoked just to be playing finals footy. Coming from, uh, we got the wooden spoon at Parramatta the year before, so we'll win a lot of games that year. I was just happy to be along for the ride, to be honest. And then, you know, even though we lost the grand final and I was devastated, and I, you know, w looking back on it a little bit later on, I thought it was a game that, you know, definitely got away from us. I just thought we're going to be back there because 
Um, you know, like we said before, Manly had already they'd won the comp in 2011 and 2008. I just assumed we were going to be back in the grand final next year. But um, there's, footy's, uh, a year in footy is a long time and uh, injuries come into it, suspensions come into it. And uh, uh, even though we had a really good season in 2014, it just didn't happen. So, um, yeah, it was a mixture of both boys for sure. Yeah, obviously going before the 2013 grand final, the week that was obviously many people talk about the week. Many coaches say just soak it all into their players. What was the leak like building up to that? And then when coming to the game, versing someone like uh, back rower, your opposing back rower, Sonny Bill Williams, what was that like? Yeah, it was, uh, I still sort of pinch myself thinking about lining up who actually went, because we played, obviously played Sonny throughout the year, but when you line up, against Sonny Bill Williams and I'm, you know, it's the kids, we had the opening kickoff and I'm sort of looking, can't help but peep, peep at Sonny um, with a, with 80,000 people at, at Homebush. It was quite a, a daunting feeling. Um, but the week was, the, we were just speaking about this in the office the other day. Like there's so much happening in that week. Um, it's hard to, re, it's, it's, it's not like anything, obviously that I've, any other week that I've had in footy before. Um, you do the grand final breakfast, you've got a media day. So it's very hard to even just get some training reps in because because we've got so many um, obligations. Um, they don't want to push you too hard on the field. Plus, it's the end of the season and, and you pretty much know by that point, point of the season anyway um, what the game plan is, um, how you're going to be playing footy. So um, it's a crazy week. I just got told uh, from some of the senior boys just to enjoy the week and take it in and don't get too flustered. Um, I thought I did a pretty good job of that. Uh, but, yeah, obviously the result didn't go our way. And um, congrats to the Roosters. After that 2013 grand final, or not after 2013 grand final, but, but later on in your career, you moved over to the Super League. What was the difference between the two competitions? And then also, how was your experience um, at Catalans and then at Wakefield? Yeah, I, I loved it, boys. It was, it was sort of perfect for where I was at. So, um, as you know, when players sort of get to about 29, 30, uh, which is the age that I was at, that's when... Um, you know, some of us start looking at overseas, start looking at Super League for the not only the footy, but also the life experiences to go over and travel. Um, yeah, so I got the opportunity to go to France. I loved it. Uh, it was a whole new experience for me, you know, learning a different language. Um, in terms of the footy side of it, it's obviously, it's a grade below. Um, it's probably, the, the, the biggest difference is uh, the, the gap between, the higher teams and the lower teams. So, you know, when we're playing against Wigan and St. Helens who have just won the comp three years in a row, you play those teams and the quality of footy is pretty good. But when you play um, at the time, Witness, Hull KR, some of these teams that just didn't have, um, because most, most teams recruit pretty well and get some good Aussie boys over there, but it's just the quality of English players probably dips a little bit. Um, that was the main difference, but so many good life experiences. I had two years at France, two years at Wakey and, um, I loved them both equally. Like they were, it was a, it was a really good life experience for me. You talk a lot about the uh, Catalans Dragons a lot as well with your with your experience over there. I just want to ask you as well. You talk about the quality of footy over in England. What do you have any sort of ideas on what could potentially improve the quality of footy over there or improve the quality of footy on the world stage? Uh, yeah. So yeah, the um, yeah the difference is the funding boys, which I was, I was talking a little bit about there. So with regards to where rugby league rank, ranks over in um, England and, and France, it's probably, you know, further down the list than what it is over here in Australia. So that, that makes a big difference in, in the quality of facilities over there. Um, the amount of money that's put into the game, into the junior development and bringing younger players through. So um, you, you sort of like the game over there needs some, some heavy hitters to get involved and make sure that facilities are a lot better. The grounds are a lot better. Um, and the junior development's a lot better because there is some really talented young English players over there. Um, you know, I, I did a, when I first got back here, I tried to highlight some of the better Super League players that were over there. Um, so there's, there's definitely talent there. It's just about developing them and, and progressing them. You know, you look at, um, you can even tell in, in with, with regards to the body shapes, like the players over here are in a lot better shape because, because of the training facilities that they got. So um, it's more it's more a money thing, boys over there, and and just where rugby league is compared to where rugby league is is here in Australia. 
Yeah, I sort of got a bit of a life question. Well, not a life question about what you do now. I was at the park training with my brother who's in year 12 now and a few of our mates and they were asking him what he's going to do after school when something that I said would be pretty mad would be like having a clothing brand with your mates and being in an office, having some podcasts and that. What is, what is it like to have mates like Corey Norman and that in the NRL and then having podcasts? Yeah, it's it's been cool, boys. So um, it, it all happened pretty organically for, for me as well. So I obviously had been mates with the boys for, for a fair while through just footy connections. And then um, when I got back from playing overseas, I come in here to do a podcast with Ice. And then he was just starting up YKTR Sports at the time. So, um, yeah, he hit me up to do a couple of podcasts. He asked, you know, would I be interested? Um, at the at the time, I, you know, probably wasn't confident to do it. Like, I didn't think I'd be a decent host or, or people would want to watch me. But in terms of, like, there was no pressure on me as well. Like, I said pretty much, he, he obviously had all the kit from from doing his podcast. He had the, the office here that we've had um, the whole time. Everything was set up for me. So I really had no excuses not to throw myself into it and just have a crack. Um, and it's been a pretty cool journey, you know, to where we are now. So, we, you know, when I when I had come on, obviously it was Chico, Ice and Normie. Um, and then, you know, they had built it up through vlogs and, and just, you know, naturally built up the brand and, you know, sold a few T-shirts. But it got, you know, pretty big by the time I'd got back. And then Ice has been able to bring on, you know, we've got, five or six boys sitting in the office here now at the moment, uh, cutting up vlogs, you know, we're planning events. So it's been a, a, a really cool experience. I'm, you know, I, f- I feel like we always talk about being grateful. I feel extremely grateful and, and lucky to get in the position that I am. Cause I don't know probably, you know, what I'd be doing now if I didn't, if I didn't fall into this. So in that sense, um, yeah, very grateful. And, and it's, it's a pretty cool work environment. You know, we, we sit here, we take the piss out of each other all the time and have a laugh and, um, get to do go out and, and create content with NRL players so it still half feels like I'm a, I'm a part of the NRL in a way so it's pretty cool boys it's a great sort of uh, it'll be a great sort of like uh, career to get into I guess um, what advice would you have for anybody looking to start their own podcast or, or is a little bit deep into it and trying to sort of climb up through the ranks in a way what what advice would you have for for somebody like that well, I'll give you, I'll give you the, uh, the advice that Ice gave me. And, and when I first started off, it's consistency, boys. You just need to be making sure that, you, you know, you're reaching out to people, you're planning, and you've got a consistent plan. And, you, it, like, the more, the more you put yourself out there, you know, you boys reached out to me for, for a couple of months now. And, and I was, you know, at one point I was really busy with the finals. But you just kept at it. Um, you, know, I, you know, I was able to come on. You, you got to do the same thing with, with other guests. And, um, it's just the more content you put out, boys, the better you get. So um, just keep going at it, stay consistent. Um, you know, keep um, yeah, you got to keep that drive. Uh, be prepared, um, like you like you've done, boys. And um, yeah, I think you're on the right path. Well, thanks for that. We'll probably wrap it up in a second, but I've just got one for you. Um, you obviously have that uh, the punting show you sort of do. Uh, you, you do th- so sort of follow the horses, the NFL a little bit. Big couple of races coming up over the uh, weekend. What's some of Scope's best? Oh, so um, I was lucky enough to get tipped in to uh, incentivize for the Caulfield Cup a couple of months ago, boys. So I got on him at a pretty good price at 20s. Um, he's come all the way into $2.50 favorite now, which is good for me. But I don't know if you uh, if you follow it like, closely, he, he's drawn uh, barrier 20. Uh-huh. So. Yeah. yeah, so he's he's out in the train station at Cor- uh, at Caulfield Boys, so it's gonna be it's gonna be tough to win from there. But if he gets up, I'll be a very happy man on Saturday afternoon. Um, and in the Everest, uh, a horse that I that you know always serves me well is Eduardo. And I think just with the uh, with the conditions, um, it's setting up nice. It's a it's a really tough race. He's had some um, some good battles. Uh, I've, I've heard Classic Legend is is running really well in, in its prep for the for the Everest as well. So it's going to be an interesting race, boys. But I will be having just a little bit of, on on, Ed, on Eduardo, but nothing too crazy. Yeah, well, we had um, well, I had uh, Karen McAvoy on uh, yesterday. That podcast came out uh, today. He said Classic Legend's running really well, but he did say if there was something else that he could be on, he put sort of Eduardo into that range. So let's hope oh, for yourself yeah. that both of those uh, horses get up. Right, well, just now... I might have to chuck it into Quinella then, boys, eh? What do you reckon? Might have to. 
Well, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, obviously, with a f- fairly busy schedule. Yeah, really appreciate appreciate you coming on. No worries, boys. Well prepared. Um, you're doing a good job. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Up there. Cheers. Cheers.